Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Jamie Edmondson. He's written Torque's Dagger, Awesome History, Wicked Twist. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Hi, Denise. It's great to be here. Hello from England. Thank you. North of North England, right? Yeah, up north. It always rains here. Oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So tell me about Torx Dagger. This is such a great concept. So they're searching for relics in the middle of a war. And it really reminded me of um, the recent movie, or not so recent, but Monument Men, and the way that they chased after relics like relics in World War II. And then when I was searching for more information, I found that you were a history teacher. So were you what type of history teacher were you and where did this all come from? Well, it's it's definitely, uh, my, my history background is definitely part of it. So the world, it's a secondary world, this fantasy series, um, which I've created and um, influenced by uh, medieval Europe. So in that way, you can think of the similarities with Lord of the Rings, um, Game of Thrones, that kind of um, world. And um, the, the, the storyline is based around these weapons that the, the heroes have to find. So yeah, Monument Man would be one example. Um, the recent um, Avengers um, TV uh, film series where they're, where they're searching for the, um, the, the kind of jewels that Thanos is after. It's that kind of idea that they, they, in order to kind of defeat the bad guys, they've got to find each of these seven weapons. And Torix Dagger, the title of the first book, is, is the first weapon that's that's in their sights. Wow. Are there seven books in the series then? Um, there's going to be four. So four. by the end of, yeah, so, so they're kind of, I don't want to spoil the, the outcome too much, but, but they kind of accumulate these weapons over the course of the series. But by, I'm, I'm actually writing book four currently, um, and there's, there's still some way to go, so they're not there yet. Wow, so books one through three are already out? That's right, yeah, I just released book three recently, so the first three are out, um, and um, I'm, yeah, as I say, I've, I've kind of done the, the, that kind of publishing side, so I'm busy at the moment writing away at home on book four. Well, the medieval elements that you put into the book are really well done. Is that based more on the history with the Celtic and the Scottish and Irish going on in the in Great Britain. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I want. I want. It's, it's quite a complex um, world. So they're they're kind of travelling through this world, and there's there's kingdoms, there's empires, um, there's lands um, ruled by non-humans as well. Um, and so, because I've got this history background, I really really wanted that world to be believable. Um, so you. People who, are, who know their history will pick up on things. They can tell that certain parts, um, the names and places um, have got an Anglo-Saxon influence, others Celtic, others German. So I really wanted that to fit together. So the names aren't kind of um, random made up fancy names. They're all kind of linking together. And I really wanted the world, the experience of the world to be believable. That was really one of my ambitions um, behind this. Um, and it was interesting when, uh, because the, the first two books have now been narrated, so they're available for audio book. So I had to really work hard with the narrator to try and get that side of it right. And he did a really good job. He's got an acting background. So he's able to really bring out the accents of the characters in different places. Um, and I really think that that added something to the storyline, which not everyone would pick up when they're reading. Oh, absolutely. It was a fascinating read. You felt like you were on the journey with them 
and he couldn't wait to see what happened next. And the way that magic was woven into it was really well done. Um, and the part about trying to play the hero and overextending yourself, it brought a lot of elements that you could just check out in your real life. That's what I yeah. really liked. And I love the chasing the relics and the places they stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as far as magic is concerned, I think when I'm reading fantasy books, I think it's really important to keep, although it's fantasy and there's magic, um, um, at the same time, when, when I'm reading, I want it to feel believable and real. So so when that character, there's, there's two main characters, there's Soren, who you're talking about, the wizard, and he's got a twin, Belwyn, and they're the kind of core of the, of the group you've mentioned. So early on, Soren um, overextends himself and he uses up too much magic. And then the reader sees the consequences of that. So from, from then on, you kind of realize that although these guys are wizards, they can't do whatever they want, whenever they want. There's consequences for the use of their magic. Um, and that means they can't just magic themselves out of every situation. Um, and so that's where their friends and allies come into it. And sometimes they're put in situations where they can't really get out of and they might fail and have to then retreat and try another way. So I think that's kind of keeps the reader engaged that these people are in a real life and death situation. And it's not always going to be a happy ever after outcome for all of them. That's true. And they start off as, you think it's going to be about thieves, and then they turn out to really be good guys, or better. The next series, yeah. the next book could totally throw this off. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of twists and surprises. I really appreciated that. I kept me just glued to every page. I couldn't wait to finish it to find out what happened. And it was Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as, as far as the characters are concerned, I, I, um, yeah, I, I wanted them to start off, um, although they've, they've got certain uh, abilities, Soren's um, a wizard, um, he can communicate telepathically with his twin sister, um, others of the characters are warriors. Um, so, so they start out with, with these kind of abilities you would expect, but they don't start out heroic. As you say, they're, when you first see them, they're conducting a theft, which doesn't go particularly well either. So they're starting off with the potential to be heroes, but they're not, and they don't really have anything um, driving them, no real ambitions in that sense. So they're, they're, they're using their powers to make money and steal things. And then as Torik Stagger develops, um, they, they start to find themselves on, on this quest, and that more heroic side of them starts to come out. At the same time, not all of them are natural heroes, so you, you kind of get the sense that some of them have that have that goodness and heroic um, aspect to them. Others of them don't, and, and, and they end up not being so likeable and evil. And then you get those characters who are in the middle, they can go one way or another, and I think that's, that's kind of real life. You have these kind of situations you find yourself in, and some people will take the right path, and some people will take the wrong path. Some people you can always trust, some people you just can't. And as you say, when the, when the reader is first reading about them in this group, the reader doesn't know. They don't know who's going to end up being the good guy and, and the bad guy. Um, and and I, and I wanted that to be that, that they're finding that out as they read. See, that was what was particularly good about the art of your writing. You really drew us in to know those characters. So we were developing a sense of trust as we read it and you know when one of them didn't work out for us it was really like ah what did i miss what did i miss and there was you know you went back i went back to look at it like did i miss something and then you're like no nope, people can just be like that yeah, well, the, the, the situation you're talking about is, is the group uh, captured, um, the, the first real bad guy they, they meet, half of the group is captured and the other half uh, has to rescue them. And at, at that point, you, you realise that one of the group has betrayed them. Um, but it's not really clear. There, there's a, there's a, I want it to be there's a few of them it could have been. Um, some of them are mercenaries. 
and their profession is selling their services to the highest bidder. Some of them are um, religious and they have those beliefs driving them. But it all means that those kind of people have the potential um, to, to, to sell out the other group, whether it's for their the religious reasons that's driving them, whether it's purely for money. Um, and so you don't quite know, it's about halfway through the book, you don't quite know which one of them it is. Um, and I wanted it to be that situation where it, it could could have been pretty much any of them. Um, and, then, and then by the end of the book, um, th there's this kind of group that's formed. It's a bit it's a bit like the Fellowship of the Ring, a kind of group that's working together. And by the end of the um, book, again, there's a there's a moment of division. Um, and um, and, and I want and I, and I wanted the kind of the, what happens in the later series is the group dynamic. They start to disappear to to have their kind of different individual quests. They end up being um, find themselves in different parts of the world, and so the group dynamic becomes more of an individual kind of test for some of these characters. Can they make it um, without the people they've relied on? Yeah, I like the development of a little possible love story in there too where you never thought that would develop that way that was cool and just the relationship of being with people even for a short period of time and learning to draw on each other's strengths and weaknesses and help each other out through it that was really well done i had fun reading that yeah. oh good yeah well they each i mean some of the characters kind of you've got this wizard who's powerful and others aren't at, at, at the uh, when you first look at them quite as powerful but they each have their skill set there's a guy who's a who's a tracker um there's a girl who's kind of um had had a kind of hard background and has, uh, has been used as an assassin in her past um, and um th those end up having a, a kind of a uh, there is definitely the potential of kind of the relationship love story side of it but the world, the world building is really part of the story for me because it's, it's, in that sense it's traditional epic fantasy as well as kind of learning about the characters and finding out about, about them and this plot where there's you know, this threat to the world so they're exploring the world and, and you the reader are exploring it with them. Um, so there's, as I've said, there's, there's non-human races they meet. Some of the main characters in the group are themselves non-humans and they bring their own um, uh, ideas which which are different and sometimes clash um, with the other characters and in the in the first book Torex Dagger um, that they're, they're working together as a group and that you do sometimes get as you would anyway with, with any kind of group these differences of opinion these kind of niggles at each other because you understand they're all from different backgrounds so I really wanted I wanted there to be men women um, you've got the wizards, the warriors, some are strong, some not so strong. Um, and, and they're all having to try to get along in Torex Dagger, even though they're from different backgrounds, they have different objectives. They're not, they're not, that they've kind of been forced together really in this book. Wow, you must have been a really interesting history teacher. Well, I did, I, I still do love my history and, and, I, and I love reading it. And, and in some ways I do... Um, miss the teaching side and I, I still keep my hand in to some extent doing doing the tutoring um, but I just um, I, I did start the writing with the teaching alongside um, but teaching is such a um, busy can be a really draining um, profession so you, you kind of teach a very hectic day teaching and then you come home and you've got to prepare the next day's lessons you've got to do your marking and I would try after after all of that I would try and sit down and, and write and my brain just wasn't having it it was it was a, a tough thing to do especially with this series that was so complex so I have when I made the decision to really go for the writing um, career side I did have to step away from the teaching and it's just given me that kind of energy and enthusiasm to, to really kind of get 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 these books out there because as I've tried to suggest they're quite heavy books that they're, they're, they're because they're complicated to read they also take a lot of effort to write because you've got lots of different character point of views um, you're jumping from one character looking at things from a second character so I, to, to, to get that right you really do need to put the effort in as a writer. You can definitely see the effort in this series. 
This book was amazing. I can't wait. To, I just really can't wait to read the rest of it. And I'm so happy that most of them are done because <laughs> I hate waiting. Yeah. So yeah, it is certainly. Um, yeah. So I've got the, I've got this one book to do, and then and then really, it's been it's it's been such a big part of my life. This series, really, on and off. So. Um, and, I'm, and in some ways, it will be sad to leave these characters behind. But on the other hand, as a writer, you're also kind of looking forward to the next, the next challenge, the, ne the next series. Do you have a plan for the next series? I, yeah, I think I'm like a lot of writers. When I speak to them, they're the same and I have lots of ideas. And sometimes when you're writing one book, the ideas for something else try to crash in and say, hey, what about me? So I, I have got a few ideas. And I think uh, I think I know which way I'm going to go. I think the next one's going to be a bit more um, light-hearted, and it's going to focus on one character, um, but it's going to keep the the fantasy element, the fantasy side of things going. So that, so I'm looking forward to 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 to, to writing something slight, slightly from a different angle as well. Oh, great! And honestly. You didn't even need to include a list of who the characters were with us. They were so easy to follow and keep track of. You know, you just knew who everybody was, everywhere you were going. It was a great flow. Nothing that you had to go back like a couple chapters and say, who was that? So, well oh, done. Oh, that's, that's great. Well, that's great to hear because when you, you do feel sometimes when you've got um, when you are ambitious and have so many characters, um, um, that that it's you know you as a writer, you know who they all are, obviously. But what is somebody coming fresh to the story? So it's great to hear you say that. Um, and what, as I say, what what develops um, like any good epic fantasy really is that this, is that the the characters find themselves um, divided. Some of them are in, in danger in the later books in this series. Some of them have, have to rescue them. They, they go to new lands and find new people. So the story expands. So one of the reasons I've got that kind of uh, character list at the beginning is so the reader can just hang on a minute. Let me just double check sort of this character who's so and so. Um, and I've also got a map in there to make sure that the, um, the reader kind of gets this kind of sense of geography when they're all traveling around doing all their um the different things each character is up to definitely so in torque's dagger who was the king because i tried to research him um to see who i could get close to he seemed vaguely familiar is there anyone in history that you drew characteristics from yeah well the um I think there's there's two there's two kind of realms, aren't there, in Torix Dagger? There's there's the there's the starting point where there's a prince called Edgar, mm -hmm. um, and he's um, he's the he's the ruler of a place called South Magnia, and there's a there's a rival kingdom called North Magnia. So what I'm setting up there is a kind of country that's that's post civil war. Civil war has literally torn their country in half. And they're kind of just kind of starting to rebuild. So that was really influenced, I guess, English medieval history. You've got things like the Wars of the Roses, the English Civil War, where, where a country of people, which in, in a lot of respects, um, it, a, a quite a united country because of the politics of the people at the top find themselves divided. And then the second main place they visit is the empire. And the empire is made up of it's a large place made up of a number of duchies, and that was really influenced by the by the Holy Roman Empire in um, Germany in the Middle Ages. So the idea that the emperor was the figurehead, but each time the emperor dies, his crown doesn't necessarily go to his son. There's an election, so all the um, the big nobles, the 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 dukes, the counts, all put themselves up for election. And whoever's the most able to influence their peers ends up being the next emperor. So another kind of, um, not a straightforward kind of kingdom, but where a number of rulers um, can, can have power. And, and the first real bad guy they meet is a duke in the empire who failed to become emperor last time there was an election. And he's decided to take a throne anyway. So even though he's not been elected, he decides with the, with the help of the kind of 
the, 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 the real evil bad guy who's in the background for most of this book, he decides to claim a throne. So these the heroes kind of wander in, not really completely realising this turn of events, wander into his um, duchy and find themselves in a lot of trouble. So as well as the kind of group dynamic of them um, looking for this dagger, built, built up around them is the kind of politics of the world which starts to have a big influence on what they're trying to do. Definitely. Yeah. No, there was a lot of different elements. There was the French, there was um, oh, that maiden, I forgot her name. El Ilana, maybe, the priestess? Yes. And she was, but it, who's she after, like, in history? So, yeah, so she's she's a character you you, you never um in Troik's dagger you never see things from her point of view so she's in all of these characters where um the reader doesn't really know where to stand with her she she's telling the other characters that she um needs to get her hands on Troik's dagger um and that's because she's um been told by a goddess um that the dagger's important to fight this evil threat so she's after this dagger for herself, whereas most of the others are have been told to retrieve it for Prince Edgar. So they're going to bring it back to him. But Alana believes that she the dagger's meant for her. And so she's um, motivated, um, as far as she's telling the heroes, by virtue and goodness to get this to get this dagger. But no one else sees this goddess, so you never really know right. how much of this is true. But she reminded me a lot of Joan of Arc, like the whole yeah. story of, of Joan of Arc. But that's yeah, so why she... the elements of the prince didn't fit, so I was, that's why I was really curious about who he yeah, was. So, yeah, so Joan of Arc is a good example because she, historically, she saved the French from the English, didn't she? And, and she, as a young maiden... Uh, was convinced that God told her to act, and she followed this this advice, um, and in, in effect w w won it for the French, who, who then betrayed her to the English. So I definitely wanted her to be one of these characters from medieval history who, who believes that um, their God is is talking to them, um, and therefore incredibly motivated and driven as, as a character. Um, but when you have someone like that, they can potentially, they're willing to do anything to, to, to get what they want. So Belwyn, who, who's the character, you really see most things from her eyes. Belwyn, we, we kind of like, and we understand where she's coming from. And Belwyn doesn't fully trust Ilana, at least at first, because she's really not sure where, where she's coming from. So it's another one of these examples where, where the relationships are, are, are really meant to be um complicated um and that that relationship between belwyn and alana really carries on in the rest of the series the um how much belwyn believes Ilana, and how much she believes there is this goddess who's there to help them um belwyn herself undergoes a lot of um changes in the way she looks at that so i really wanted this series to be about um definitely counter development about you, you cut you don't you they don't know everything in the in the first book and their eyes become opened um so it's one of those series where you really have as a reader have to be ready to kind of trust me as a writer that that it, that it is going places because um it's a series you know it's not a, it's not one book it's a series and you, you don't get the final payoff till the end of book four i don't know i think it was an epic journey and i don't feel that I was going to miss anything. I just was hoping that the next book was done so I could continue <laughs> and find out what was going on with the quest. It just drew you in. So I just imagine from researching you that you must have been an awesome history teacher that really got people involved in the classroom. Because definitely, well, the book is great. Go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, most of what most of my career as a as a teacher is the the sixteen to eighteen age group. So that's in in England. That's the kind of period just before university. 
So we were able to really go into a, a lot of depth um, in the in the classroom because you had students who were really bright and, and really keen on on history. So we did we did um, the Norman Conquest. We I've taught the Tudor period where you have the kind of um, political complexities, um, women rulers like Elizabeth the first. Um, I've taught Nazi Germany where you have um, you know this this kind of rise of, of evil and how some people go along with that evil and some people stand up against it. So I'm sure that all these kind of real life human stories that, that you spent a lot of years with, um, I'm sure all of those are in there somewhere. Um, and um, but but when when you learn, you know, the more you learn history, the more the more you realize how complex the world is, how complicated humans are, how how the same human can do something terrible and something good uh, and so that that's really i think that's what's coming out in this series definitely thank you for sharing so much about it and giving us such an epic adventure to read i love it well well thank you for inviting me on it's been a real pleasure talking to you denise oh my pleasure until next time keep asking questions and torx dagger by Jamie Edmondson is an awesome adventure that won't let you down.